Okay, so welcome to the um, uh, the Hospedia IT screenshots course. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go through the different screenshots. I'm just going to make some explanations um, and maybe go into a little bit more depth about different areas and sort of point you in the right direction for each of the screenshots. Um, so the first one that we're going to look at is the idea of logging on to user accounts. So at their at their most basic, um, and because I'm running this in a sort of a virtual window, I, I can actually log off and we can still see the screen. So what you can do is, you most, uh, most modern day computers have the um, ability to have more than one user uh, use that machine. So um, I've only got one user account created here, but this would be, um, this would be me logging onto this system, okay? And the benefit of having multiple users, if there's more than one of you that regularly uses the computer, then you, each person might want it customised in a slightly different way. And so between different user accounts, you can set your own desktop backgrounds, excuse me, is that? <coughs> you can set your own desktops, but more importantly is how the programs themselves work. So you could configure, for example, Outlook uh, with one, one email account, and then the Outlook on the different user, when that user was logged in, could be somebody else's emails. And likewise, sort of Internet Explorer, you could have one set of favourites for somebody, and then when the other person logs in. So every time you log into a user account, you get a personalised experience that's just for that user. And the way that you actually can set up users is um, if I go into the control panel, I've got mine set up on the sort of the shortcut control panel, but here at the bottom of the screen is the option for user accounts. And uh, if I go in there, I'll just fire that up. And here's, here's the uh, pane that comes up. And it's quite a simple process to actually create a new account. Um, there are two different types of accounts you can create, so I'll just create one here called test on my screen here, called test. And basically you get two choices is the, is the main choice you have to make. And the choices are, are you going to make the person a computer administrator, in which case they have full access rights to the whole computer, uh, they can totally cock things up if they wanted to, um, or you can make something a limited account, okay? Um, and limited accounts, they're not allowed to install programs. So often what you'll get in a corporate situation Often what you'll get in a corporate situation is one administrator account and then everybody else has a limited account where they're allowed to run the applications that are installed on there, but they're not, they're not allowed to uh, install new programs. And so by having those two different levels, having a computer administrator or a limited type of account, um, you, can, you can make the machine a lot more secure. Okay, so we're just looking here at that screen for creating a new account. I'm not actually going to go ahead and create it. I'm going to cancel out that. Um, and then you can, you've got a few little options. You can change the way. So what will automatically happen generally is um, that you get the, it automatically generally logs you in to one account if you haven't set it up. Um, but you can use the welcome screen, which is where you get uh, prompted to choose a different user. But if you've generally got one user on the screen, one user on the computer, sorry, it will generally just log you straight into that user account. Okay. So that's a little something about user accounts there. Um, the next screenshot is how to shut down or restart. And I'm sure I don't need to spend any time on that. That's uh, a, a simple screenshot bringing up the shutdown dialog box um, and run it from there. So that's... Ah, I'm so used to running it in a virtual machine. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Okay, um, give me a second to think about that one as, we, as I'm going through it, um, because everybody's got to have that. What about a screenshot, you could have a screenshot here if you're hovering over the turn off, I'm sure that would work. So something like I've got on the screen there, so just showing the, just showing where the option is to, I mean it's one of the smaller little feet, one of the smaller little things where we just have to demonstrate that people know how to turn on and off a computer correctly. So a screenshot just like that that would do of of the icon hovering over the turn off computer button. Um, so desktop shortcuts. Uh, 
desktop shortcuts are often you, I've got I've got a few on the computer, a few on the screen at the moment. But what I want to do is show you how you go about creating them, and there there are two different methods that you can use to create them. Often you'll get a program automatically create you a desktop shortcut. Um, but I'll show you how you go about creating your own one. What you do is you right click somewhere in the um, somewhere on a blank bit of the desktop, and you go to shortcut, uh, and you go to new, sorry, and then choose shortcut. And then you'll, you get this little dialog box that comes up. And all you're basically doing is you're going to navigate through the computer to a place where you want your shortcut to link to. Okay? So I've, I've done here one in my sample pictures folder. And then I'm going to press OK. That will fill in the exact location of where I want the item to go. And then you give it a name. Well, sample picture sounds like a pretty good name to me. Um, and then when I go ahead and press the finish button here in a second. Um, it will then place a shortcut on my desktop um, and when I double click on that it immediately takes me, it opens that folder up. Okay? That's the sort of the long way of doing it. A much easier way of doing it is to navigate in the first place to where you want your um, shortcut to be. Okay, so let's say we want a shortcut of my pictures and then you right click on the item you want your shortcut, and one of the options you've got is send to desktop. In brackets, it says create shortcut. So you can see that on the screen there now. And when you go ahead and create that shortcut, um, it does it does the same thing. But I much prefer doing it that way. I don't tend to ever use that shortcut wizard. But I was just showing you both methods that you can use to to see that. Okay. So any any screenshot of either of those two in action will be will suffice. I'll just delete those two now. Let's see what we've got next. So, um, adjusting the display settings. There's sort of two, two main things that I want to go over with display settings. Um, you get to it by right clicking, there's a few ways, but the easiest way is to right click on the desktop and choose properties. Um, and then the display properties comes up and the end one is the settings. Now, I'm going to click on advanced here just because I want to bring up the monitor profile. And I just want to talk about these. This doesn't apply with these with modern monitors, but I know some people have got still um, has anybody still got the large CRT monitors? You know the really big ones, look like tellers or old-fashioned tellers? Yay. Um, so that CRT, that stands for cathode ray tubes. Um, and what you might notice with those sometimes is you see them flicker. And the reason you see them flicker is what's happening is uh, the way it draws the screen is it starts at the top and then it, it's drawing it really, really quickly um, in lines going down the screen. I'm frantically waving my hands in front of me here just to simulate that. Um, but by the time it's got to the bottom, the top is not there anymore. It's actually blank at the top and it's just sort of drawing the bottom of the screen. And it does this like 50, 60, 70 times a second, and it's often referred to as the hertz rate, the refresh rate. But the eye can detect like 50 frames a second. You can see, and you, sometimes you'll notice a flicker, but it can't detect above 70. And so one of the things that you used to be able to do on uh, the old-fashioned monitors was come into this dialog box that I'm on here, which is, um, which is changing the refresh rate. Uh, but I can't do it because obviously I'm on a much, I'm on a modern, it's not a CRT monitor. But if you've got a CRT monitor, then in here, you'll be able to specify the refresh rate. And I, I always suggest setting it to um, the highest number that you can. Uh, because that should reduce the flicker, or in, it actually increases the flickering, but it goes beyond where the human eye can see it. So that's, that's one thing. That's, that, so that's the refreshed rate. The other thing that I want to talk about is the... Uh, the screen resolution size. So at the moment you can see here that this resolution is set to 1280 by 800 pixels. And a pixel, if you if you take your eye, and don't do it for very long, but if you go right up to your screen and like press your nose against the glass, you'll see that the screen is made up of these little dots. And each one of those represents, um, is a sort of, is a pixel. Okay, that's the smallest element you know, one pixel turned on is the smallest element that your monitor can display. Um, but what you can do is you can change how many pixels the screen... Uh, you can't change the physical number, obviously it's set, your monitor's set with however many pixels wide it is. I mean, I've got a particularly big monitor here, um, 
and I, I just make the screen resolution much smaller for this for what we're doing here. But I can actually bump this all the way up to 2048 pixels by 1536. Now let me bring up a little diagram that my I took a screenshot of this earlier on just to because it is a bit of a thing to get your head round. Oh, that's not it. Hang on a second. That's still not it, Dan. Hang on one second. Where is it? Today, here it is. Okay, so have a look at this. So the red square is the same number of pixels wide in each of these three uh, in each of these three, three screenshots, or these very small ones. Okay, so imagine that 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 is. I think it's two hundred by two hundred pixels. That red square. It gets smaller depending on the higher size resolution of each screen, and that's just because. Imagine. So in the very first one, it's quite easy. In fact, it's six hundred and forty pixels across and four hundred and eighty pixels high. Now, if the red square is 200 pixels, then it represents roughly a third of the width of the screen. And we can see that quite easily, yeah? It's about a third of the width. If you change your screen resolution to make it, instead of 600 wide, you make it 1,000 wide, then it goes from a third of the size of the screen to a fifth of the size of the screen. And this is why, when you change your screen resolution, the icons appear to change. Because the icons are fixed width. They're all like, I don't know, about 70 pixels wide. But if you make the screen very, very small, then they take up a greater proportion of the screen. And if you make the screen very, very big, then, uh, then they take up a, a much smaller percentage of the screen. And so your, your, whole, um, res your whole monitor uh, desktop and things, and all the icons appear to change, well, they are changing in size. Um, but I just wanted to hopefully explain why. So the larger the screen resolution, the smaller a percentage everything makes up of it. The bigger the screen, or the bigger the number, the, sm the smaller the number there here. So if I go right down to the smallest, which is 800 by 600, then everything is taking up a larger percentage of that than if I go. So look at that. The difference in mine is three times the size from 800 at one end to 2048 at the other. So some, so icons are going to appear to be two to three times different in size. Okay. So that's how uh, that's how screen resolution works and. What you want really is uh, is a screenshot either of adjusting the refresh rate, which was the first thing, or, or just bring up this um, this panel and just have a screenshot of changing the resolution. One of the nice things that um, I think from XP onwards is when you say OK and change the screen resolution, because you could accidentally change it and it goes up terribly wrong, um, it counts down. It gives you, I think, 15 seconds and it counts down and then after those 15 seconds are over, which I'm not pressing anything, it will reset my screen resolution. So if you accidentally make a change to your screen resolution and the screen goes black, for example, don't randomly click around, just wait 15 seconds and the screen resolution will reset back to, uh, back to normal. Okay? Um, setting up a new folder on your computer is just too easy to even bother talking about. <laughs> you just right click, I'm sure everybody knows, oops. <laughs> you right click uh, and choose new folder and then you've got a new folder so that it's just it's just some of, some of the uh, some of the things I ask about are very easy some of the things are very hard or, or harder so now the next one says use the add hardware wizard to connect IT equipment so this is where it starts getting a lot more interesting um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to right click on my computer and I'm going to choose properties Okay, so I'm, I'm clicking on the icon that says my computer and I'm going down to properties and then it will open up this system properties tab. Okay, and one of the, and I've got like eight different or seven different tabs here and one of them says hardware. So I'm going to click on that uh, and then in the top right hand corner of the uh, tab that then displays I've got the option of device manager. Okay, and this is going to enable me to explain what the hardware wizard actually does. So this device manager, these are all of the things that are either internal inside my computer or physically connected to my computer. But this is all the different, uh, all the different bits of hardware I've got. So for example, there's some easy things that we understand, like keyboards and mice. Okay. 
And then there are things that we might know about, like network adapters, which is just, you know, um, it's the port in the back where you plug a network cable, like an Ethernet cable or something like that. Uh, and, you know, we've even got some legacy things like floppy disk controllers, which uh, we probably don't, don't use anymore, although I bet some of your machines have got floppy disk ports on them. Um, and we've got the CPU processor and things like that. Now, what, ha what has to happen is there are so many different computer manufacturers. You've got... Microsoft making the operating system, and then you've got a whole bunch of other people that don't make computers but make parts for computers like scanners or printers or webcams. And all these, these three things have got to be able to talk together. And the way they talk together is by using what's called a device driver. Now, it doesn't have to be scary. All you have to think of a device driver as is simply a method um, for which the computer understands how to talk to something. And so there's loads of them built into Windows XP and there's even more built into Vista and Windows 7. So they do a really good job these days of you hopefully not necessarily having to install device drivers. Um, but you, you, you will always encounter it some, at some point. And so when you buy, say you buy, um, if you were to buy like a, a second-hand printer off of eBay that was a few, couple of years old, the chances are that um, you plugged it into a modern computer like Windows 7, chances are Windows 7 wouldn't just straight away know what it was because it's already got the device driver built into it. But with either very new software, so if you bought a state-of-the-art printer that just came out, that's not going to have any device drivers inside the computer ready for it yet. So what you have to do is you'll get a disk. So you always get disks with, um, with a with new bit of hardware. And unfortunately, they do install a load of rubbish on your machine, um, all sorts of stuff you don't want. But there's one thing on the disk that you do want, and it's called the device driver. And it just, it just tells the computer how to use the device that you've plugged in on, a, on like a hardware level. So just, just a very simple example, you plug a printer in, you, you run the device driver for that printer, and then the printer know, the computer then knows that when it says print blue, it know, it, the device, it, the printer itself goes, ah, right, I know what you mean by blue, and it doesn't print red out or something like that. So the device driver enables different devices to be able to communicate at a hardware level with the computer. Okay, And so why have I brought this device manager up? Well, I've purposely got two devices here that have got question marks next to them. Okay, And that's because the computer doesn't know quite what these are. All right, And one of them is a video controller, and the other just says base system device, which really means it hasn't got a clue. So one of them is to do with the monitor, all the graphics, uh, and the other is base system, base system device. So what you want to do is the add hardware wizard. So there's a couple of ways of getting to it, but if I was, for example, to choose um, update driver, okay, then it launches me the hardware update wizard, which is the same as the um, add hardware wizard. And all these things do, they don't actually physically connect anything to the machine, or they just, all they do is they just check that you've got the driver, okay? They just they just make sure um, they look on the internet for the driver for you. Uh, what they're really hoping is that you've got the driver on a disk or something like that. So you even get the question, can Windows connect to Windows Update to search for the software? And you get a bunch of options about yes this time, or no, not at this time, okay? So this is the sort of screenshot we want. We can also access it, instead of going through the device manager, we can also access this from, um, control panel and it's under add hardware okay and here we get the ad you know so that's the other way you can get to it and basically just click next into here uh, I've started it off there um, so it's searching on my computer I think you know I told it there we go so it's had a quick check it couldn't find anything so now it starts asking me some diagnosis questions to try and work out why it can't spot the new hardware the reason it can't spot it is because I've not plugged anything in but a screenshot of this um, hardware wizard is what we require. And then the next one is, um, is just show connection of hardware device. And there's a few things that you can already see that are connected. Um, so for example, I'll go into control panel again, and I'm going to go to the mouse. Okay, so here's the next sort of screenshot, would be a screenshot of the mouse, for example. And under, you know, you've got loads of different ways you can configure your mouse and things like that. But you can tell from this screenshot, 
which you'll see in a second. It says hardware and it says device status. This device is working properly. So we just want a screenshot of some device plugged in and working properly. And you could do the mouse, you could do the keyboard, you could do the monitor. There's a few different ones that you can bring up. But they're all under control panel and a screenshot of, uh, of that device. Okay, so then the next idea is adding a printer. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, I've got a printer installed here, so I'm going to click on this printer and then I'm going to choose to delete the printer. And then I'm just going to very quickly go through the process of setting this, this up again because it's, it's quite a simple process. Um, give that a second to, uh, so I've now got a warning that there's no, that printer's been deleted, there's no printers on my computer. So let's just go about. So, I'm in the control panel and I've gone to printer and fax, okay? And there's a little option here that says add a printer. So I'm gonna click on that. And then I get a uh, add printer printer wizard dialog box pop up, okay? And my computer is actually connected to me via a network. It's not plugged into my computer. So I'm just gonna choose this, um, this option. I'm just going to untick automatically detect because it won't automatically find it because it's not plugged into this computer. So I'm going to choose next. And then I happen to know that it's um, because it's across, it's, it's on the network. So here's the IP address of my computer, of my printer, 192.168.250.222. Okay, so I'm going to choose next. And then it's going to go off and find it. And then this is the bit, which is exactly the same really as the add hardware wizard. It's saying install the printer software, but what it really is wanting is just the device driver for your printer. Okay, and so, and this is what I was talking about, about all these ones that are built, all the stuff that's built in. There's a huge list of different manufacturers here, and then even bigger, under each manufacturer, there's dozens of types of printers. And so, Windows understands all these printers straight off the bat. It will be able to install these, no problem. Um, but like we say, what always happens is, or, normally always and the other thing you can do is you can just download these things off of the website for companies as well but you normally get given a disk so I'll say I have a disk here but if you haven't got the disk uh, just go to the website and download it and then I'll just uh, find it so here's here it is and then I'll say okay and it'll probably tell me in a minute so the printer happens to be this uh, AAMDM here Press next, then you name the printer. The printer name is purely for your own convenience and just something that uh, something that you recognize, so you don't have to worry about what you type in in this box. And again, any of, any of the screenshots of this bit will be fine for the ad printer. Uh, and then I don't want to print a test page there. So that's gonna install that for me now. Okay, and so once I've installed it, the, ne the, la the, second, uh, the next screenshot is just show the, show the printer is successfully installed. And you can do that just by double clicking on it really and bringing up this printer dialog box. Um, you can go to uh, properties, that's the one. Okay, so I'll just show you, let me just show you how I got there again. Under printer, there is the option for properties. So I'll just give it a second for you to be able to see that. And under, under properties, uh, it shows you that the printer is installed correctly. Um, so, a, a screenshot of this part of this page, or a screenshot of um, just just of this uh, printer window showing that this shows you the queue, or the uh, or the print, or the information that's been sent to the printer. So either of those two would do. That would be absolutely fine. What have we got next? So a screenshot of connecting to your internet homepage. So that's just that's demonstrating that you've got um, an internet connection. So that's easy enough to do. Configuration of antivirus software. So my antivirus software recommendation is free and it's um, called Microsoft Security Essentials. And it's very, very good. Uh, there's a whole bunch of um, different options. So a screenshot, just something like this, just bring up your antivirus program. Um, you can specify what time of the day that they, you know, if it, what time of the day or night it does its uh, scheduled scans across the computer. You can limit, uh, there's a whole bunch of options here to limit CP usage during scan. So obviously what that means is, you know, you don't want it suddenly taking over your computer um, or, run, you know, or not even taking over, but just using up so much of the computer resources that the computer runs very, very slowly. So you can um, choose, choose the options here. 
And there's a whole bunch of different options that you've got. But that's all we really want is just a screenshot here of uh, just showing the um, showing whatever antivirus program you've got running. Okay. And then lastly, ah right. Now some people just haven't got this on their computer. Um, but it's the ability to eject memory cards. So if I have I got a memory card at the moment? All you do is on this little, it's very hard to see, but there's a little green. Uh, it's a little green arrow um, which should be in the uh, bottom right hand corner of your screen. Um, if you can't see it, um, then you right click and you do show hidden. Um, and that will bring it up. I haven't actually got any hidden icons, so I can't show you that. But all you do is you click on it once, and I've got a whole bunch of different things here that are connected to my computer that I could safely remove. Um, but if you have, for example, a USB stick, um, then it will appear here. Uh, in fact, I'll just plug one in for one second. Okay. So I plug in my USB stick into my computer, which is attached to my keys, which is why I made so much noise. And I will then get the option. Uh, well, I should get the option. <laughs> Somebody's got a cough. That's all right. I've had it. <laughs> and so that basically, yeah, I think it's. Ah, well, what you can do in that case, so for print screening, instead of left clicking and doing it, you can also access this by right clicking and choose safely remove hardware. Can you see that's just coming up on the screen now? And that then brings up this safely remove hardware box and you'll be able to get a print screen of that.